Wael spoke earlier about our focus on performance, discipline, and simplification. And I'm going to talk about how we're applying this to the integrated gas and upstream businesses that are key to our success. Specifically, integrated gas and upstream feature four outstanding businesses. Conventional oil and gas, gas to liquids, liquefied natural gas, or LNG, and deep water. Today, I'm going to focus my comments on the distinctive world-class capabilities of our LNG and deep water business. We are the world leader in LNG, supplying our customers with secure, reliable energy today and in the future. LNG is deeply integrated with our trading and optimization activities, which enable us to capture additional value from the scale and breadth of our global LNG portfolio. And we're growing that portfolio even more, with around 11 million tonnes per year of new LNG capacity under construction, which will come on stream in the second half of the decade. This is almost a third of our current LNG portfolio. In our upstream business, Deepwater has a proven track record of sustained cash flows from high margin, lower carbon barrels. And thanks to a strong portfolio of projects, which includes our resilient conventional and oil and gas business, we have a break-even price of $30 per barrel on projects coming on stream between 2023 and 2025. Continued investments in oil and gas will be needed to make sure that the energy transition happens in a balanced way, with a secure supply of affordable and increasingly lower carbon energy. We will contribute to this balanced transition by focusing our investments on the most profitable and carbon competitive projects spending about 13 billion a year of capex in our integrated gas and upstream business through the decade. Total production will grow from 2025, given our confidence in our portfolio and our capabilities. Now let's see in more detail how these businesses will continue to extend their market leadership. Our focus on value over volume performance and discipline has driven sector-leading unit cash flows with our integrated gas and upstream portfolios generating more cash flow per barrel than any other integrated oil and gas company over the past four years. LNG will play a key role in a balanced energy transition as it produces fewer greenhouse gas emissions than coal when used to generate electricity and fewer emissions than petrol or diesel when used for transport fuel. We see continued strong demand for LNG in the medium term and expect to grow our LNG term sales by 20 to 30% by 2030. When we launched our Powering Progress strategy, we said that we expected a gradual decline in our oil production of around 1 to 2% a year to the end of 2030. We have achieved that reduction earlier than expected through targeted divestments, and now expect to maintain our liquids production at approximately 1.4 million barrels of oil equivalent a day by the end of the decade. This takes into account the decline we'll see from portfolio simplification in areas like onshore Nigeria, where we intend to reduce our involvement in onshore oil production while remaining in deep water and gas positions. As our oil production then stabilizes over the next years, we will keep our focus on value over volume. As Sinead mentioned earlier, we'll achieve operating cost reductions through further portfolio simplification and through testing new business models and ways of working. For example, our upstream position in the Netherlands has reduced base operating expenses, excluding utilities, by 30% since 2019 through the implementation of a lean operating model. We will continue to high-grade the portfolio, focusing our spending and expertise on opportunities with higher margins and lower carbon emissions. As I just highlighted, 
Our portfolio positions us well to generate significant cash flows into the next decade. Integrated gas and upstream combined have commercial resources with a life of more than 20 years. And if you look at total resources alone, we are right in the middle of our peer group, the sweet spot, you could argue, for a company pursuing a balanced energy transition. But what really differentiates our portfolio is the high margin activities, with the largest percentage of our commercial resources in LNG and deep water, both areas where we are world leading. From the beginning of 2023, through 2025, we will have brought online projects with a total peak production of more than 500,000 barrels of oil equivalent a day. This includes two new platforms in the Gulf of Mexico, three floating production, storage and offloading vessels in Brazil, as well as Pierce and Penguin's oil and gas fields in the UK. We're also developing many smaller projects as shown in the chart on the bottom right. We will invest in areas where we have proven ourselves to have deep experience with the geology. Our hurdle rates for integrated gas will adjust to an 11% IRR, for upstream to a 15% IRR, and only where we see a risk profile that is consistent with that return. Although we believe that hydrocarbons will be needed for a long time to come, we are also acutely aware that these barrels will need to be increasingly lower carbon. With this in mind, I hope it's clear that hurdle rates alone will not solely dictate our capital allocation, but they do remain an important factor. As stated before, Shell doesn't anticipate new frontier exploration entries after 2025. We'll focus our exploration efforts on extending the life of heartland positions and on the Atlantic margin, where we have unique expertise and deep understanding of geological features of this basin. Before I move on to LNG, let me briefly comment on our opportunity in Namibia, which is evolving quickly. Since 2022, we have drilled three exploration wells and one appraisal well in Namibia. We also recently conducted a successful flow test, the first ever test of this kind in the country. We're in the process of reviewing the encouraging results and are focused on determining commercial potential, moving efficiently and at pace. In LNG, our integrated model is at the heart of value creation, as we are the leading global marketer, with a business spanning upstream, liquefaction, shipping, marketing, optimizing for customers, and trading. To give you an idea of what I mean by value creation, we estimate that LNG marketing, trading, and optimization contributes a 2 to 4% increase in return on average capital employed in integrated gas. And despite some quarterly volatility, and partly because of our decision to position our portfolio toward the Northern Hemisphere winter, earnings over a 12-month period are stable and largely follow oil and gas price benchmarks. The marketing side of our LNG business uses our supply portfolio to serve our extensive network of customers and generates stable margins from the spread between our portfolio of supply and sales contracts. In some cases, by purchasing gas against prices linked to Henry Hub and selling gas against prices linked to oil. With our global market presence, unrivaled access to customers and knowledge, our trading and optimization organization can create further upside and take positions that add value, especially during times of high price volatility. We invest in LNG capacity where we have a competitive advantage. For example, we're adding 11 million tons per year of LNG capacity through new projects in Qatar, along with additional processing unit in Nigeria, and of course, our project in Canada, where the plant is now more than 80% complete and on track for first cargo by the middle of the decade. Critically, this world-leading project is designed to achieve a lower carbon intensity than any other LNG plant in operation in the world today. Beyond our own production, we also scale 
and flex we also have the scale and flexibility to our LNG portfolio by buying LNG from others. Most of our new contracted volumes will come from North America, for example, from LNG projects like Venture Global Plaquemines and Mexico Pacific. We can also use and scale our balance sheet to enter contracts in the early stages of projects and to obtain attractive terms. Increasing utilization of existing LNG plants is the most important way we can increase short-term value, as these are our lowest cost additional LNG volumes available. That's why I've made it my top priority to address the supply and operational issues that have caused the underutilization of our LNG assets. And it's why over the next three years, we'll invest around two billion every year in projects that increase the supply of natural gas to our LNG facilities. I'm pleased to say in the first half of 2023, we've already made progress. In Trinidad and Tobago, for example, we've increased gas production through the delivery of Calibri and Barracuda projects. And we have further gas supply options, including the Manatee gas project. In Nigeria, we've increased our capacity to produce gas in our upstream business. But we are facing severe challenges in our network to increase the supply due to continued vandalism of the pipelines. Our teams continue to collaborate with the Nigerian government and other stakeholders in, with the aim of addressing the crude threat from the facilities and the resulting impacts that this has on gas production. These efforts have already led to improved security. Another area where we're focusing on performance is Prelude, our floating LNG facility in Australia, which is a complex design with many first-time applications in a remote location. Our operational record at Prelude has been challenging, but we're seeing steady improvement and recently exceeded 100 days of continuous operation for the first time. We're also seeing faster recovery from operational trips with record production in March and April and continued strong performance in May. We have a multi-year plan to improve Prelude's operational performance, including a planned turnaround later in the year which will help reduce the vulnerabilities. We've demonstrated before, for example, when we commissioned our Pearl Gas Liquids Plant in Qatar, that we can use the breadth of the Shell's organizational capabilities to move from a challenge start to a high-performing, world-class asset. Turning our attention to another high-margin business where we have unique capabilities, let's look at deep water. This is a business with higher barriers to entry. And not only have we been the first movers in deep water from the start, but we continue to reach even higher levels of performance through our near field opportunities, our technical expertise, our strong partnerships, and our model of simplification and replication as we develop deep water fields in the next decade. We're the largest operator in the Gulf of Mexico, and we're making the most of our portfolio creating the most value by focusing on opportunities close to our existing assets, which are in the best corridors of the Gulf of Mexico. This allows us to access the critical infrastructure to develop shorter cycle, high value tieback opportunities. We are top quartile in well optimization, according to industry benchmarks, which enables us to protect and grow our existing production bringing us some of the lowest cost barrels available. We also continue to innovate and add new volumes, projects like Vito, our newest platform in the Gulf of Mexico, with a peak production of 100,000 barrels of oil equivalent a day. Improvements to the original design of Vito reduced costs by more than 70% from the original concept and will reduce carbon emissions by about 80% over the lifetime of the facility. Vito will serve as a blueprint for other projects such as whale. In Brazil, we're the largest foreign producer. We're adding three additional Miro floating production storage and offloading vessels in the Santos Basin. And we're adding barrel barrels where we have opportunity to leverage our world-class partnerships and technical understanding for greater value. For example, by increasing our stake in the Atapu field. Let me summarize before going to your questions. 
we believe oil and gas will play a significant role as the world transitions to a low carbon energy system. Our leading integrated gas and advantaged upstream business will continue to drive cash generation for Shell into the next decade. Our performance is underpinned by our value over volume approach and a strong resource base. We will be disciplined with our capital, allocating around 13 billion in annual cash capex towards higher margin and carbon competitive opportunities. I'm really excited about even more value from this simplified structure of a combined integrated gas and upstream business. So now, over to your questions. We've got about 15 minutes of questions. So let's go here. Yeah. Thank you, um, James Hubbard from Deutsche Bank. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Zoe. Uh, two quick questions. Um, tying back to some of the earlier questions, actually, the, the, the stable liquids target now from upstream of uh, out of 2030, the, the prior target to me seemed to imply a, a liquids decline of at least 2% per annum and maybe closer to 4% per annum. And, and for a scale of portfolio that you have, going from that to zero is actually a huge leap. Right? If I recall over the last many years how hard it has been for large oil companies to maintain production flat even without resorting to organic or, or investments into things which they subsequently disposed of because they destroyed value. So I'm, I'm just wondering, is this all about um, more aggressive efforts on underlying decline mitigation, or should we expect a wave of uh, new projects that are going to make their way faster through the hopper or go through the hopper, which maybe two years ago they, they wouldn't have done? Um, and then secondly, veto sound. The, I, I read this on the plane out here as well, the 70% uh, decline in costs you achieved. I mean, I, is there any chance of any more detail on that? Because it just sounds staggering for a, a, an industry which has been installing deep water platforms of various designs in the, air, in the area for, for well over what, 15 years. You know, how did that 70% come about? Because it kind of begs the question, was the initial design <laughs> um, uh, gold-plated in some way? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great questions. Um, I think the first thing I'd say around our stable liquids production is directionally we're in that 1,400 million barrels, but we have flex to be slightly up, slightly down. The primary driver behind our forecast is really about making sure we continue with the value over volume thesis and, of course, making sure it's underpinned by generating the stable cash generation. Um, you saw on the chart we have about over 500,000 barrels being brought on stream in the next two years. And those projects, you see the breakdown, it's about 40% from deep water, just under 40% from our conventional oil and gas business. They have various decline rates, but on average at Shell, we have about a 3% decline rate. That offsets for the natural decline with things like WRFM activities and other water flood and opportunities for optimization. So when you think through um, the contingent resources that we've got and the commercial opportunities, I'm actually really confident about our ability to underpin that. I think the second question around veto, in some respects it picks up on the thread that I think Whale referenced earlier, around the days where I think upstream was much more driven by spending capital and protecting for any scenarios of subsurface um, facilities. So the approach that has been taken with the support of our projects and technology team within Shell is to really go through minimum scoping, really understanding what's the minimum kit that's required, recognizing that the subsurface has a range of uncertain outcomes. And so we no longer um, manage our topside facilities on the basis of a P50. It's actually more on the basis of a P90 reservoir outcome. That allows you to be more fit for purpose around um, the, the engineering aspects. Okay, cool. Um, people we have not had yet. There. Peter. Hi, thanks. It's uh, Peter Lowe from Redburn. Um, just a couple of clarifications. Um, can you give a bit more clarity on when you expect LNG Canada to start up? You mentioned the middle of the decade, but it doesn't look like it's included in 2025 in the volume chart on slide 26. 
And then kind of sticking on that slide, um, again, it looks like LNG offtake volumes are falling slightly to 2025. Um, what's driving that? Is that contracts expiring or underlying declines in production at uh, some assets? Thanks. Yeah, thank you. So I think worth stepping back and reminding ourselves that we look at the integrated value that we get out of our LNG portfolio. Of course, that's a combination of our equity production as well as the third party contracts. What you see in our forecast is indeed the combination of the two, recognizing that our world-class trading and optimization provides the opportunity to, to glue that integrated system together. With respect to equity, um, that is around uh, LNG Canada, which we have um, announced to be mid part of the decade. Um, but it's also around the volumes that we're bringing in through CATA um, and the other work that we're doing around uh, feed gas supply and operational improvements to underpin the equity production that we have. I think as it comes to um, the third party contracts, um, we have continued to find access to valuable third party contracts through the course of time. We have many of those um, contracts which I think have been relatively de-risked. Um, Calcasieu, for example, is already, of course, in operation. Um, the Plaquemines is actually um, taken FID. So we've got confidence in our capabilities to continue to access value accretive third party contracts over the course of time. And of course, that two to 4% ROACHI uplift is something that we have seen constant and fairly rateable over the course of time, which of course recently has seen quite different market uh, contexts. All right, we'll keep going, okay, here. Yes, I'm Patrick from UBS. Um, the first question is on the, the production outlook for liquids up to 2030 to 1.4 in Namibia. Um, is this something that um, you've included within the target or we should think about Namibia as potentially providing some upside to the 1.4. Um, and then secondly, you mentioned um, you know, projects being carbon competitive. I was wondering if you can elaborate on how you uh, look at carbon intensity as you look to select prioritized projects. Yeah, thank you. Um, Namibia is not included in the volumes that we have forecasted out to 2030. Um, if we can further accelerate the de-risking of Namibia, Namibia, it's possible that some volumes could come in at the very back end of that time horizon. But for now, we've assumed that's largely outside the window of 2030. Um, but we are, like I mentioned, I think what we're most pleased about in Namibia is that we have so far out of the three exploration wells and the one appraisal well that we have drilled, we have had top quartile well performance in every single one of our um, activities in Namibia. Um, and so I think we are confident that we can de-risk that at pace. I think um, Sinead mentioned earlier that we've got access to the deep sea um, bolster, which is the rig, enabling us to actually do well um, performance across the seasons. So we can actually continue de-risking activities across um, without taking seasonal breaks. Um, I think in terms of um, carbon uh, competitive, it's very much, as I mentioned before, when we look at capital allocation, we are looking at not only the returns, but we also look at things like the break-even prices to determine resilience, and we also look at the carbon competitiveness of the project itself. And so that's fundamentally a, an integrated part of the way that we make our capital decisions. Okay, cool. You know, we've had a few people already, but then we're going to go and return. Okay, Martin, we haven't had you. You were a little bit late at the table, though, so you're lucky. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, hi, hello, it's Mark Rats and Morgan Stanley. Um, I want to ask you two questions about LNG. And the first one is a bit of a market question, because the LNG market has sort of turned, um, well, surprisingly soft after the events of last year. And th there is a bit of a window where the market could be tight, but from sort of 2025 onwards, there's quite a lot of supply coming on. So if, if we're looking at two years which are not so tight and then a lot of supply, it, it, it sort of could lead to a bit, a bit of a stretch off a bit of sort of softness. But I was wondering how you sort of, how you sort of see that play out. And, and the second question, but perhaps if, if there are any sort of green shoots and Asian demand, that sort of thing called the gas switching, if you have any view on that, that would be much appreciated. And connected to that, I was wondering if you have any sort of comments about the likelihood of uh, Tanzania LNG uh, ever going ahead or not. Is that the third question? <laughs> Tanzania LNG. Okay, so um, the first one, I think, when you have a look at our performance in integrated gas, you see that we have been able to deliver consistent earnings over the course of various macro conditions. 
And of course, that's the, um, the essence of our leading strategy. You see that the equity supply that we have typically sort of maps to the absolute price context. The marketing and optimization activities that we have are more around the spread between our supply contracts and our sales contracts. And then, of course, our trading activities enable us to make money when there's volatility. You rarely have, as the markets evolve, all three of those collapsing in one hit. And hence, we do see the 2 to 4% Rowachi uplift from our trading activities being relatively consistent over the course of time. Additionally, you can also see, despite the sort of seasonal volatility, where we do see various um, things shift, and because of the way we've got both the length and our prices focusing towards the Northern Hemisphere winter, on average, our annual performance is still quite consistent and pretty rateable. So I think for us, um, it's hard to predict how the market's going to evolve, but the strength of the underlying strategy that we have in our business model is that it's quite resilient, whether it be to absolute price, to the spread, or indeed to the volatility. I think to the question around um, Asian demand, and I think you may have heard Cedric and Steve, they're here, give their LNG Outlook um, uh, presentation uh, a few months ago. We're still really quite positive about the um, LNG market and the opportunities that are likely to prevail. So I think I'm still very um, confident in the LNG outlook um, from our position. And Tanzania LNG, I think um, we have been doing a lot of work and pleasing to see um, some strong engagement by the government in the sort of commercial terms that could uh, create the foundation of a decision in Tanzania. Um, but we're not yet at the position where we're, um, of course, making any firm uh, decisions, but one to watch as we seek to de-risk. I think a very short question. Paul, you have a short question? Thank you, Risa. I did, I'll, could you just clarify again on LNG Canada? When do you plan to start it up, and what are the risks? Thank you. Yeah, so um, we um, are 80% complete. Um, we've de-risked a significant part. Um, we're not giving any more clarity than the mid part of the decade. So we're feeling confident about mid part of the decade that that will come online.